Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Secrets, Lies, and Consequences, A Great Scholar's Hidden Past and His Protégé's Unsolved Murder, by Bruce Lincoln, narrated by Tom Beyer. Publisher's Note In this audio edition, you will hear references to materials present in the print and ebook formats of the book. That which is hidden, from the simple fact that it is dissembling, becomes a peril for the individual and the collective. A sin is surely serious, but if it is not confessed, it becomes terrible, as the magic forces provoked by the secret end by menacing the entire community. Mircea Iliade, Secrets, 1935 1. A Sheaf of Papers, 1991-2017 In May 1991, Yuan Kulianu, Associate Professor of History of Religions at the University of Chicago Divinity School, approached a colleague with a request to safeguard some papers. Less than a week later, Kulianu was shot to death in the Divinity School men's room. The papers he sought to protect would eventually come into my hands. This is their story. The act of writing this book has been not just technically difficult, but emotionally fraught. The text that follows is the result of more than a quarter century of what might euphemistically be called incubation, but is more accurately characterized as evasion, repression, and some haunted mix of half-knowledge, anxiety, and sorrow. The dreams I had while writing it suggest how disturbing I found, and still find, this material. In one, I saw myself with a band of ragged milicianos in the Spanish Civil War, under fire and terrified, but determined to halt fascism at any cost. In another, while gardening in my backyard, I unearthed a corpse that stirred slowly and revealed itself to be barely alive. What should I do? I cried in a state of panic. How can I help? To which the aged, filthy figure replied, Just leave me alone. Cover me up and let me rest. From 1971 to 1976, it was my privilege to study under Mircea Iliada and serve as his research assistant. Iliada was the world's foremost historian of religions at the time, and remains one of the giants of the field. I cannot say enough good things about the way he treated me. Despite his accomplishments and stature, I found him remarkably approachable, modest, and unassuming. In our dealings, he was unfailingly generous, kind, supportive, and encouraging. What I said of Professor Iliada in my first book, which grew out of the dissertation he directed, remains heartfelt and true. His insight and genius are available to all in his many books, but his warmth, enthusiasm, and friendship are a particularly treasured memory for me. There was, however, another side to the lovely man I knew. During the years I studied with him, it came to light that in his younger days, he had been involved with Romanian fascism. Those revelations sparked controversy that runs hot to this day. For years, I sought to avoid the ugly debates that followed, telling myself and others when necessary, Mr. Iliada was my second father, whom I loved and to whom I am indebted in countless ways. Like all fathers, he was not perfect. Having become aware of his failings, I cannot continue to sing his praises without reservations, but it is hardly my job to denounce him in public. Honesty requires that I acknowledge and regret those charges that are true, while rejecting those that are unfounded or exaggerated. Conversely, loyalty does not mean defending the indefensible. Rather than getting embroiled in polemics, my preference is simply to remember all that I found most admirable in him. There was also a specific incident that inclined me toward that position. When Professor Iliade, 
agreed to supervise my dissertation, he expressed some sentiments that he recorded in his journal on other occasions. When I take on new students, he began, in what was clearly a well-rehearsed speech, I prepare myself for the day they will betray me. I have come to expect that, since it is a necessary step if they are to become creative in their own right. I found this statement confusing at the time. Decades later, I still do. On the surface, it is high-minded and generous, granting preemptive absolution for a yet-to-be-committed offense, one that he saw as the inevitable climax of a successful initiatory process. At the same time, it was an incredibly manipulative gambit, to which I responded, as was no doubt expected, Oh no, sir, you have no need to worry. I could never be so ungrateful. And in some sense, it worked. Although my own work has changed much since my student days, advancing values and views markedly different from those of my teacher, I have always taken pains not to write anything that might be construed as betrayal. Several things prompted me to reconsider my position. First was an article I wrote with my daughter, Martha Lincoln, a medical anthropologist whose fieldwork in Vietnam alerted her to a veritable epidemic of ghosts and haunting. In our paper, we sought to understand this and other hauntological phenomena as a set of beliefs, practices, and experiences that manifest the enduring power of the past in the present, forcefully reminding survivors of their unfulfilled obligations to, ongoing relations with, and ultimate accountability to the dead. Second, an observation Iliade made in one of his early works caught my attention. It suggested that, his later reticence notwithstanding, Iliade understood full well that even the most shameful and painful secrets must be disclosed. In 1935, he wrote, That which is hidden simply by being hidden, becomes dangerous to the individual and the collective. A sin is surely serious, but a sin that is unconfessed and is kept hidden becomes terrible, as the magic forces unleashed by the act of concealment in time menace the whole community. Magic or not, the secrets he struggled to preserve had terrible consequences for those who became aware of them, some of whom sacrificed their careers, their scholarly integrity, perhaps even their lives. The most immediate stimulus, however, was a serious mistake I made, one involving those papers that Yuan Kulianu had entrusted to a colleague all those years ago, papers that have bearing not only on Iliada's past, but on Kulianu's murder. 2. Ioan Petru Kulianu was just 41 years old when he was killed, on the afternoon of May 21, 1991. He had gained his position at the University of Chicago's Divinity School just three years earlier, and was widely seen as Iliada's successor. The crime was shocking and remains unsolved, although multiple theories have been offered including those that focus on disgruntled students, jealous spouses, drug cartels, Chicago gangs, and occult covens. Most widely accepted is the theory popularized by Ted Anton, that agents of the Romanian Secret Service, Securitate, killed Culianu in response to critical articles he wrote for the émigré press which threatened their post-communist hold on power. Those articles drew complaints and threats, and in the week before Kulianu's murder, the threats became sufficiently serious that he entrusted the papers to our colleague Mark Krupnik, whom he asked to safeguard them. Shortly before his own death in 2003, Krupnik gave me the manuscripts 
and explained how he came to have them. He was not sure what to make of the papers themselves, nor did he understand why Iwan entrusted them to his care, since the two men were not particularly close. Perhaps it was a chance result of their office's proximity. Mark speculated that his own identity as a Jewish scholar, whose research centered on Jewish fiction, testimonial, and autobiography, might also have had some relevance. The papers, it turned out, were English translations of articles Iliada had written in the 1930s, including a good number in which he voiced his support for a movement known under two names that signaled its religious and militant nature, the Legion of the Archangel Michael and the Iron Guard. Although these articles were key pieces of evidence in the debate about Iliada's past, few people had actually read them. In communist Romania, surviving copies of the right-wing dailies in which they originally appeared were consigned to the special collections of select libraries, access to which was tightly controlled. Requests to view such material triggered state suspicion, and few were foolhardy enough to take that risk. The articles contained passages that shed light on the bitterly contested question whether, and to what extent, Iliada shared the Iron Guard's virulent anti-Semitism. When I received these manuscripts, I was not prepared to deal with them or the serious issues they raised. I gave them a cursory reading and persuaded myself that, on the crucial question, they were neither damning nor exculpatory, but sufficiently nuanced, ambiguous, and elusive to admit rival interpretations. Determined to continue my own work and avoid entanglement in the endless, acrimonious debates about Iliada, I put the papers in a manila folder and buried them in my files. There they remained until June 2017 when I retired from teaching. While cleaning out my office, a task I found inconvenient and annoying, and thus undertook hastily, I carelessly let that folder go to the dumpster, along with many others of no great importance. Freudians will say this was hardly an accident, and I am in no position to disagree. A few days later, realizing the enormity of what I had done, I resolved to do whatever I could to rectify it. Since the papers could not be recovered, I decided that the only responsible course of action was to learn Romanian, locate the original articles, translate and study them myself, and make the results available. As I made this vow, I could hear the voice of my Dr. Vater, for Professor Iliada was always urging me to learn new languages. You could pick up X easily, he would say, since it's just like Y, which you already know, with some added vocabulary from Z. Finding the original Romanian articles proved easier than I expected, as they had been collected and republished in 2001, but there was much in their content that I did not initially comprehend, and so I continued to gather material, translating numerous related texts that helped me understand the context of these old publications, Romania's situation between the two world wars, Iliada's position in the intellectual, cultural, and political life of his country, the role played by Naya Ionescu, his mentor and patron, and the turbulent group that had Naya and Iliada at its center. Beyond this, I was led to other texts that show how Kulianu got drawn into the Iliada controversies, how he became aware of the legionary articles, what he made of them, and what he was planning to do with them at the time of his murder. Most of this was written in Romanian and Italian, with occasional pieces in German and French. As a result, Monoglot Anglophones have had to rely on the way these materials have been characterized 
by the few scholars writing in English who had competence in these languages. Kulianu, Mac Linscott Ricketts, and Adriana Berger, each of whom interpreted the evidence in ways strongly inflected by a desire to defend or prosecute Iliada. Wading through this material, I came to believe that my chief responsibility is to make the relevant documents more fully and readily available. It was thus my intention to include translations of the texts Kulianu entrusted to Mark Krupnik as an appendix to this book and to make them easily available online. Kulianu's own efforts to publish this material had run into determined opposition from Christinelle Iliade, who inherited the copyrights from her husband. My efforts were similarly checked by Sorin Alexandrescu, Iliada's nephew and one of two literary executors to the Iliada estate, who similarly refused permission, despite the strong support of his co-executor David Brent, for the translation's publication. Fortunately, copyright to all these articles will expire in 2028, at which time I plan to make my translations available in one form or another. In the following chapters, I thus can do no more than quote from those documents and offer the inferences I have drawn from them along with the interpretations and hypotheses I consider most likely. My own views are less important, however, than the evidence itself. Experience suggests that what I have to say will not resolve the debate about Iliada, nor identify Kulianu's killer. The material is revealing, however, and holds more than a few surprises. 2. A Hidden Past, Part 1, 1927-1937 1. The treaties of Trianon and Paris were signed on June 4, 1920 and October 28, 1920, respectively. Among the last steps concluding the First World War, they ceded Transylvania, Banat, Bukovina, and Bessarabia, previously Habsburg, Romanov, and Bulgarian territories, to Romania, virtually doubling its territory. The territory was a reward for Romanians who had contributed much and sacrificed greatly during the Great War. But it was also the result of shrewd maneuvering by Queen Marie, who persuaded the victorious powers that a strong Romania would provide a secure barrier against Bolshevism. This expansion realized long-standing ambitions for a greater Romania, Romania Mare but it also brought new ethnic groups into the nation, Hungarian, German, Slavic, Turkic, Roma, and Jewish, that aroused xenophobic resentment and seriously destabilized national politics. Further, as a condition of these territorial grants, the victorious allies obliged Romania to confer full rights of citizenship on its Jews. Article 7 of the country's post-war constitution, adopted March 1923, fulfilled that commitment but was resented and resisted by a great many ethnic Romanians. Those involved in several potent right-wing parties accused the country's political class of having surrendered to foreign pressure or, worse yet, having been corrupted by Jewish money. Ever since the revolutions of 1848, Romanians had been divided on whether to modernize and westernize, or alternatively, to defend and emphatically reassert key features of their distinctive national identity. In the post-war period, this long-standing conflict acquired new urgency, and passions became more heated. Political debate on virtually all issues, including urbanization, industrialization, rationalism, cosmopolitanism, banking, the press, education, 
culture, and parliamentary democracy consistently broke down along this same line. Over the course of the 1920s, however, the ultranationalist right increasingly saw Jewish interests, conspiracies, and corrupting power as the source of all the nation's problems. It was during this period that Mircea Iliada, the son of an army officer, was schooled at the elite Spiru Haret Lycee, along with a group of talented youths who would remain his friends and colleagues for many years. While still in Lycee, he began publishing short articles, drafting novels, and keeping a journal, some entries from which register his political opinions, strong at times, but also in adolescent flux. On January 31, 1923, he wrote, Like all the boys, I'm anti-Semitic out of intellectual conviction, and I tremble that the anti-Semitic demonstrations aren't succeeding. Within a year, however, he was reading Marx, Engels, and Kautsky, while toying with leftist ideas under the influence of a close Jewish friend, Mircea Marculescu. After Lycée, he advanced to study at the University of Bucharest, where his copious writings included fiction, literary criticism, topical commentary, semi-scholarly articles, and polemic pieces. During these years, he mostly affected a stance above politics, construing the latter as the dirty business of parties, elections, and government offices. In complementary fashion, he understood culture, the realm of philosophy, religion, literature, the arts, journalism, and all spheres of the imagination, as the most potent means to reshape society. Many of the values he championed in his early publications, particularly those voicing his sense of Romania's unique national character and destiny, were consonant with those of the indigenous right, an affinity that grew stronger over time. Like these rightists, he considered modernity a disaster imported from the West by political elites and misguided cosmopolitan intellectuals. Being foreign, both literally and figuratively, modern fashions and institutions threatened to undermine the unique spiritual values that were core to Romania's greatness. As he saw it, modernity's characteristic disregard for the sacred had distanced humanity from the wellsprings of its creativity, an error that could be reversed in some measure through such pre-modern and anti-modern technologies of the sacred as mysticism, asceticism, and magic. Consistent with this critique, Iliada celebrated the primacy of the spirit, a phrase taken from Catholic philosopher Jacques Maritain, and felt that the task of restoring his nation's endangered spiritual values fell to himself and others in the young generation. Most broadly, this included those who experienced the Great War at a critical remove, having been too young for combat, and could thus perceive how modernity's trust in science, progress, and secular reason helped produce the war's dehumanizing horrors. In contrast to the older generation, who fought the war and realized historic ambitions for a greater Romania, he understood his own generation's mission to be cultural, not military, economic, or political. Although he used the term young generation as a slogan and branding mechanism, Iliada acknowledged he was speaking more narrowly about and on behalf of a relatively small group of intellectuals who styled themselves an elite. Central to this group were a few dozen students of Naya Ionescu, the charismatic, influential, and well-connected professor of philosophy and logic at the University of Bucharest. Reacting against the positivistic strains of philosophy previously dominant in the Romanian academy, 
UNESCO introduced discussions of faith, salvation, authenticity, and experience into his classes. Here, as in his public lectures and journalistic salvos, he maintained that the Orthodox faith, particularly its mystical aspects, was central to Romanian identity. As such, it provided the best antidote to the shallow rationalism and selfish materialism he identified with Western Europe, other forms of Christianity, which he considered defective, and parliamentary democracy, a form of governance that produced partisanship, corruption, and fragmentation, undermining any nation's unity and spirit. UNESCO made a point of recruiting his best and most loyal students to write for Cuvantul, The Word, the popular right-wing newspaper he edited from 1926 until its suppression in March 1934. Among the first and most important of those to do so was Iliada, who published a manifesto of sorts under the title Spiritual Itinerary, which appeared across 12 issues of Cuvantul during the autumn of 1927. Here and in numerous subsequent articles, Iliada argued that the political goal of creating a greater Romania, having been accomplished by their predecessors, the mission falling to his generation was to establish Romania's cultural greatness by producing literary and artistic works of extraordinary spiritual depth in which they would synthesize tradition and innovation in ways informed by their daring experimentation with myriad forms of religious experience, mystical, ecstatic, meditative, magical, alchemical, ascetic, erotic, and so on. Writing with an extraordinary mix of zeal, passion, erudition, impatience, and swagger, he rapidly gained an enthusiastic following and was widely acclaimed as the leader, Romanian chef, literally chief, of the young generation. For nearly a decade, Iliada continued to regard politics and the political class with disdain, while urging his contemporaries toward the spiritual endeavors and cultural accomplishments he considered vitally important. Implicit in many of his publications from this period is the ambition he shared with others in his group who wished to elevate Romania to the status of a major culture. Thus, in an article titled Romania in Eternity, he argued that the true goal of nationalism is to raise a country from the transient plane of history to that of the eternal. This is something that can be done only when a country's creative geniuses express their people's distinctive values in such novel, compelling ways that the whole world is brought to recognize, celebrate, and remember them forever. Aeschylus and Plato accomplished that for Greece in antiquity, as did Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Dante for Italy during the Renaissance. But Iliada believed a single genius could accomplish the same miracle, as Kierkegaard had more recently done for the Danes. The implication, of course, was that he, and perhaps others of his generation, would do the same for Romania. Despite the grandiosity manifest in this text, a certain insecurity creeps into its closing passages, where Iliada acknowledged the anxieties underlying his ambitions. It is not just that he aspired to immortalize Romanian culture. More poignantly, he hoped to rescue his country from a situation in which it was ignored, or worse yet, ridiculed. I think with horror that another kind of eternity awaits us Romanians, the proverb. We enter into the proverbs of other nations, just as the Scots, Irish, Jews, and in the Balkans the Gypsies have done. We are stereotyped, and until we are known beyond our borders through our masterpieces and our Romanianism, we are known through our politics and inner shamelessness. 
I don't know if any of you has recognized how seriously we are compromised. Only a few steps, and we will enter an irremediable state from which no one will ever extract us. The proverb will become our Lord. And just as it is said, rightly or wrongly, that Bulgarians are stupid, Poles are vain, and Spaniards exceptional lovers, just so it will be said that Romanians are thieves. It has begun to be said, not only in newspapers and European political circles, but also through proverbs. Listen to one of them collected by Knickerbocker. When someone steals, it's kleptomania. When many people steal, it's mania. When a whole people steal, it's Romania. Doesn't that make you blush with shame? This is the eternity that is being prepared for us. This is all that politics, the administration, and our official national culture have done for us since the end of the war. What emerges from this unintentionally revealing article is a portrait of its author as a young, ambitious intellectual who feels burdened by the fact of his birth in a relative backwater, who dreams of international fame but fears becoming the butt of jokes. By way of defensive reflex, he lashes out at those he blames for putting him and his country at such risk, Romania's politics and political class. By the mid-1930s, he had identified democracy as a significant part of the problem. We must choose between a slow, larval, humiliating evolution, meanwhile being ridiculed by our neighbors, and a violent, heroic, risk-filled revolution, a revolution that will make people speak about Romania as they have never done before. The former, the larval and humiliating evolution, is the ideal of Romanian democracy. The other, Revolution, chauvinism, inexhaustible faith in the destiny of Romania is the ideal of the rest of the Romanian populace. Little do I care whether what will come will be dictatorship or not, whether it will be tyranny, anti-democracy, or who knows what. Only one thing matters to me, whether the problem of Romania will be the dominant problem, whether in the name of this Romania which began several thousand years ago and will end only in the apocalypse, social reform will be achieved with sufficient severity. Whether the corners of the provinces overrun with foreigners will be recolonized. Whether all traitors will be punished. Whether the myth of our state will be spread everywhere within our borders and the news of our country will be carried across our borders. To me, then, it is entirely immaterial what will happen in Romania after the liquidation of democracy. If, by leaving democracy behind, Romania becomes a strong national state, armed, conscious of its power and destiny, history will take account of this deed. It would be ridiculous for us to place any hope in formulas, to say to ourselves, we know that democracy hasn't done anything much for us. We know we're deluged with lackeys and traitors. We know that politicianism has paralyzed us. But we can't give up a modern and civilized formula to go back to tyranny. In fact, it is not a return to tyranny, but rather a great national revolution. Obviously, such national revolutions don't suit anyone but the nations that make them. Neither our neighbors nor the great powers will like it if we become a powerful state. And that is why they encourage us, gently or with force, to maintain the most blessed socio-political system, democracy, which classes us fatally with Afghanistan, Albania, and Lithuania. Two. In the same year that Iliada published his spiritual itinerary, Corneliu Zelia Codrianu, who also yearned for Romanian greatness of a spiritual sort, led a small splinter group 
out of A.C. Cusa's National Christian Defense League, then the most important party of the ultranationalist right. While Codreanu, who styled himself the Captain, Capitanul, shared Cusa's ideology and fierce anti-Semitism, he found the older man's tactics too restrained. Codreanu chose to name his new group the Legion of the Archangel Michael, drawing on the Orthodox tradition's understanding of this dragon-slaying archangel as commander of the heavenly forces, defender of the faith, and protector of Christian nations. By defining themselves in this fashion, its members consciously constructed themselves not as a political party, but a martial religious order sworn to protect the faithful, an orientation that helps explain the appeal it came to have for Iliada. Recent studies of fascism have devoted considerable attention to the legionary movement as historians and political scientists have come to recognize that fascist regimes did not rely on force, intimidation, and indoctrination alone, but also cultivated and enjoyed broad popular support for much of their duration. As scholars began exploring the ways fascist culture, aesthetics, myth, and ritual helped produce such support, Romania provided a telling example. Two related themes emerge from what has been termed the new consensus in fascist studies, the sacralization of politics, and a mythology embodying the conviction that a nation must return to its original authentic nature in order to achieve its destined greatness. Fascist movements that fit this mold regard their nation including its ethnic identity, bodily substance, unique culture, landscape, and spirit, as having fallen into decadence, corruption, and humiliation at the hands of sinister forces, foreign enemies, internal traitors, in response to which they promise to produce a national rebirth through their struggles and sacrifices. Codreanu's Legion offers a telling example. On the one hand, it took the Romanian nation, Niam, and homeland, Tsara, to be a sacred entity whose spiritual identity was grounded in and defined by its orthodox faith. On the other, it demonized those it defined as the nation's enemies— Ottomans, Habsburgs, Muslims, Fanariots, Catholics, and Protestants in the past— Russians, Hungarians, communists, liberals, corrupt politicians, lying journalists, and Jews, above all, in the present. Against such forces, legionaries construed themselves as a mystic order of soldiers and would-be martyrs, bound to one another and their leaders by sacred oaths and solemn rituals, designed to transform dispirited, confused youths into bold, virile, new men, who would accomplish not just a reform of the Romanian nation, but its resurrection. The Legion's distinctive blend of religion and nationalism included a mystic bond to the land itself, eagerness to sacrifice oneself for the nation, a sense of ongoing communion with heroic ancestors, and militants in the salvific mission of rescuing an afflicted people from religio-ethnic others. As a convenient example, consider Codreanu's account of the proceedings through which the first legionaries constituted and consecrated themselves as a group. The ceremony began with the mixture of earth taken from the tomb of Michael the Brave in Turda, the earth of Moldavia from the battlefield where Stefan the Great fought his most serious battles, and from all those places where the blood of our ancestors 
was mixed with the soil in the course of cruel battles. When this earth had been mixed, many small sacks were filled and given to everyone who had taken the vow to be worn on their chest. This vow consisted of five questions and responses, to wit. 1. Do you commit yourself for the justice of the endangered fatherland to overcome all your personal interests and desires? Response, yes. 2. Recognizing that domination by Yids, Jidani, leads us to spiritual and national destruction, do you commit yourself as a brother with us to struggle for the defense, cleansing, and emancipation of the ancestral land? Response, yes. 3. In this struggle, will you support the legion of the Archangel Michael? Response, yes. 4. Will you carry this earth on your breast with devotion? Response, yes. 5. And will you leave us? Response, I will not leave. 3. If the Legion's induction ceremonies reflected and reproduced its self-understanding, so too did the story of its origins, as recounted by Kodreanu. His small band of militants originally called themselves Vakarashteni, with reference to their October 1923 incarceration in the Vakarest prison, where they took solace in religious devotions. Every morning at seven, we would go to the church in the prison's courtyard in order to pray. We gathered, all on our knees before the altar, and recited Our Father, and Tudose Popescu sang Holy Mother of God. Here we found consolation for our sad life in prison and hope for tomorrow. On November 8th, the day of the Archangels Michael and Gabriel, we discussed what name we should give to the organization of the youth we were planning to form. I said, The Archangel Michael. My father said, There is an icon of St. Michael in the church by the door to the left of the altar. I went along with the others. We looked and were truly amazed. The icon exhibited to us an incomparable beauty. I had never been attracted by the beauty of any icon. Here, however, I felt connected to this one with all my soul, and it gave me the impression that the sainted archangel is alive. From here, I began to love that icon. Whenever we found the church open, we entered and prayed at that icon. Our souls were filled with peace and joy. The aura of sanctity and tranquility is hard to reconcile, however, with Kodriano's earlier account of how the Vakarishteni came to be imprisoned. Apparently, one of their group informed authorities of his comrades' plan to transform earlier student protests into a campaign of assassinations. Here again is Kodreanu's description. The first problem that presented itself to us is this. To whom must one respond first? Who are more responsible for the disastrous state in which the country is floundering? Romanians or Yids? Unanimously, we fell into agreement that the guiltiest are those Romanian scoundrels who betrayed the country for Jewish silver. The Yids are our enemies, and in this capacity they hate us, they poison us, they exterminate us. Romanian leaders who align themselves with them, however, are worse than enemies. They are traitors. The harshest punishment is deserved by traitors in the first place, enemies in the second. If I have only one bullet and an enemy and a traitor are in front of me, I would send the bullet into the traitor. Ultimately, the group decided to execute six cabinet ministers in the liberal government, starting with Gheorghe Marzescu, the Minister of Justice, who was responsible for the laws that secured citizenship rights for Jews and outlawed extremist political parties. Had they succeeded in killing Marzescu and his fellow traitors, 
the group planned to dispatch those Jews they identified as the nation's foremost enemies, rabbis first, then bankers, publishers, and journalists. Chilling though the passage is, it fits neatly into Kodrianu's writings, which seethe with rants against Jews and the political class, along with calls to violence and a commitment to propaganda of the deed. In October 1924, Kodrianu himself shot and killed a police chief, then defended himself as having taken proper vengeance on an enemy of the people, winning acquittal on all charges. Later assassinations were carried out by legionary punishment squads, who were trained to await the police after dispatching a victim, thereby offering themselves as a sacrifice on behalf of the nation. Their victims included three prime ministers, two heads of the secret service, two leaders of opposition parties, and apostates from the legionary movement, along with scores of others. Singular in its brutality was the murder of Mihail Stelescu, a former legionary commander and member of parliament who had broken with Kodreanu to lead his own movement. A punishment squad of ten members, accordingly mythologized as the Decemviri, entered the hospital room where Stelescu was recovering from surgery, shot him more than a hundred times, dismembered his body with an axe, then sang and danced around his mangled corpse while waiting for the police. This and other less grisly acts figured prominently in legionary propaganda and in legal defenses that, in several well-publicized cases, led to acquittal. Treatment of enemies, that is, Jews, was equally self-confident in its violence, and the Legion's brief period of state power, September 1940 to January 1941, featured pogroms of obscene brutality, in which seven synagogues were sacked, several hundred victims killed, and many more robbed, beaten, and tortured. Most grisly of all was the fate of 13 Jews killed in the Bucharest slaughterhouse who were suspended on meat hooks and fitted with a placard identifying them as kosher meat. 4. In the years when the Legion first took shape, Iliada was absorbed in other pursuits. From 1925 to 1928, he studied at the University of Bucharest in the Faculty of Philosophy and Letters, taking his degree under Nai Ionescu, with a thesis on the Neoplatonists of Renaissance Italy who, as both teacher and student saw it, offered a mystic alternative to rationality at the dawn of the modern era. During the same years, he served on Kuvantul's editorial board, where he published a great number of cultural, literary, and philosophical articles, building on the success of his spiritual itinerary. Then, having become interested in Indian philosophy for some of the same reasons that inspired his thesis, he traveled to India in 1928, where he spent the next three years studying, traveling, learning languages, engaging in ill-fated love affairs, and gathering material for subsequent publications. Returning to Bucharest in 1931, Iliada resumed whirlwind activities at the university and at Kuvantul. His involvement with the latter continued when Nai shifted the paper's political orientation sharply rightward. Previously supportive of King Carol II, and aligned with the National Peasant Party, in 1933, Kuvantul became one of the most vigorous and influential champions of the Legion, sufficiently so that the government closed the paper the following year, when it rallied support for the Legion and its three members who carried out the assassination of Prime Minister Ion Duca. Iliada rejoined the editorial board of Kuvantul during the brief period in 1938 when it was permitted to resume publication, 
having contributed a steady stream of articles to other right-wing venues in the meantime. In this period, he continued to work closely with Naya Ionescu, who supervised his groundbreaking dissertation on yoga, 1933. Thereafter, he served as assistant professor for Ionescu's courses, for which he was paid out of his mentor's own pocket, since the University of Bucharest considered him too controversial a figure to be granted an official position. At the same time, he produced a steady stream of journalistic articles, along with three volumes of essays, eight novels, three scholarly monographs, a translation of T. E. Lawrence's Seven Pillars of Wisdom, and long introductions to the collected works of the two Romanian scholars he most admired, B. P. Hastiu and Nai Ionescu. Conditions in Romania were changing quickly, however, in ways that affected Iliada and his circle. Most broadly, the economic effects of the Great Depression made it increasingly difficult for young intellectuals to earn a decent living or anticipate a productive career, which drove many to more radical politics. At the same time, the Legion expanded beyond its base in the provinces and began courting intellectuals in Bucharest. Among the first to lend support was Nikifor Krainik, one of Romania's best-known, most militant theologians, who embraced the Legion in 1932. Two schoolmates and close friends of Iliada's quickly followed, Mihail Polyhroniada and Ion Victor Vojen, who founded the journal AXA Axis, in October 1932 and made it the leading vehicle through which the Legion cultivated intellectuals. Late in the following year, Naya Ionescu, who had been a close advisor to King Carol II, became frustrated by his inability to persuade the monarch that parliamentary democracy should be replaced by an authoritarian regime. Whether acting out of wounded pride, on principle, or some mixture of the two, Ionescu shifted his support and that of Cuvantul to the legionary movement, bringing many of his students and admirers with him. <laughs> 